Every game you make in Game Maker requires a room. This is something in your game like a menu or a level or really anything that's on the screen for your objects and sprites and everything to draw to so your player can see these things and interact with them. To create a room, you can right click on rooms and click here to say create, or you can go to resources and you can create a room right here, which is Alt R. Uh, either way, when you do it, you'll get a new room and it'll automatically be highlighted, this text field, and you can name the room at this point. So we can call this room test, and I'll hit enter, and we have our new room. Now, on this side, when you open it up, you're going to get three panels. We're going to get a layers panel, a layer property panel, and the room properties panel. And in the middle, we actually have our room. We've got a grid turned on, and we have this toolbar up here. As well, we now have a drop-down menu for room. The first thing I'll talk about is this toolbar over here. I mentioned we have a grid on because this is toggled. If I press G or click on this, the grid will go away. If I want to change the grid options, I can click on this drop-down here. I can change the color. There are some default colors here. Or I can also change the alpha. This is the transparency of the grid. So if I crank it up, it becomes more opaque, and if I put it all the way down, it's less opaque, it's transparent or see-through. I can also type in a value, and I'll go with 50 where it was before. I can also toggle snap with Control g or clicking here. So when I drag my objects and assets and whatever into this room, uh, they'll snap to the intersections on the grid based on the origin point of the sprite, if you remember the origin point. I can also change the grid size based on the X and Y value. I can increase and decrease them, whatever I need to do for sub subdividing my room into a grid. The next three options are your zoom. You can zoom out, zoom in, or you can reset the view back to a more one-to-one -one look. We can also click here to center fit. This will center the room in view and fit it to the window I've got for my room. For instance, if I drag it over here and zoom it out and hit center fit, there we go. It'll center it and fit it in view. I'll go over the next three buttons when they become relevant. The first thing I want to talk about is the layer panel over here. This is a hierarchy of places to put assets into the room. And we have different types. We have um, a background one, a, an instance one, and we can add more. So right here we can add a background layer, add an instance layer, add a tile layer, which I'll go through when we get into tile sets. We can add a path layer, and we can watch a path video when that's made. An asset layer, and I can create folders so I can group them together to make it easier to manage all the different layers I'm going to have. And I can click here to delete, or I can just hit the delete key. The first thing your game will probably need is a background. Now you can drag a sprite from here into the room, and that'll add it to the background. Like, if I've got this background layer selected and I drag this in, it's going to go and snap to the very top left coordinates. That's 0, 0 for X and Y. Now, I don't want to do that because I don't actually have a background layer to drag in. But that is, that is how you would do it. And if you did do that, in the Backgrounds Property panel, we can select what sprite we want to use, or drag it in as I did. I can select a different one if I want. Then I get a few options. One is Color. This is a blend color, so if it's white, it's the original colors you've made the sprite look like. But you can always blend it with another color, and we have a lot of different options here. Uh, we have the RGB values, or red, green, blue. We have the alpha, or transparency. We can also change the hue, saturation, or value. There are also some basic colors over here, and you can type in hex code if that's something you like, and you can save new colors as you change them. So. Let's just say I made it this purple, I can hit save new color and it'll add it there. If I say OK to this, we can see that it's got this more purple look to it. Now it's not exactly this color, it's blending this purple on top of it. That's why if you blend white on top, you just get a neutral look, the same color it was over in your sprites resources right here. But I don't want to do that, I just want it to be regular white, so I'm just going to pick this basic white, and there we go. It's the same way it looked before. Now if your background doesn't stretch the entire size of your room, 
you can always tile it. I can tile it horizontally, and that will just go from wherever uh, it started, uh, left and right, until the room ends. I can also tile vertically, same thing, but uh, vertically instead of horizontally. I can do both, and it fills the whole room. I can also stretch this image to fit the entire room. So these are options you can do uh, if you have one tile you want to stretch across your entire room or tile across your entire room. It also doesn't have to start exactly at 0, 0. I can offset it. I can increase these values in pixels. So I can make it 50 pixels in uh, on the X, and I can also make it whatever on the Y. There we go. So if I tile, it'll still tile the whole room. It'll just use that as the start point and still tile left and right, up and down. I can also set some animation speeds here. I can set the horizontal speed and the vertical speed. This will make this image, whatever I've made my background, move horizontally. Uh, positive would be to the right, negative to the left. And vertically, positive down, negative up. And if I do that, let's say 10 and 10, every step of my game, my background image will move 10 to the right and 10 down. Now, if I press this play animation button over here, anything that can animate in the room will animate, and it'll show you what it looks like. This will also affect this background speed. So there we go, and it just falls away. And I can stop that animation by hitting the pause button. I'm going to reset those back to zero. The animation speed is actually locked right now. It's basing it on the animation speed I had set for the sprite. Now, I can change it if I want. I can say I don't want it to follow uh, that speed. I can go in and change it to whatever I want. And that will not change the animation speed of the actual sprite. It's just when it's in this room in this one instance. The last option here is depth. Let me just lock that. And it'll set it back to 15. But the last option is depth. Depth is used to determine which images will be drawn on top of other images. So the higher the depth value, the further back the image is in space. Uh, you can think of it sometimes like looking down a well. Uh, the higher the depth, that's how far it is down the well, how deep it is. And if something is of a lower value, it will be in front of the thing of a higher value. Now I could change these myself, but they're actually set up based on this hierarchy. So my background layer is 100, and my instance layer is 0. Whatever your top layer is will be 0, and anything below it will increment by 100. If I added a new background layer, this one would be 100, and this one would be 200. If I change this value, let's say 50, that means this background layer will now be 150. It's still 100 depth away from the thing above it, in this case my instance layer. I'm going to set that back to 0 and lock it. Now I don't actually want to use this image for my background, so I'm actually going to delete it by going to No Sprite, either in this list or in this image selector. And now I'm going to use a background color. So let's make some sort of blue. Uh, there we go, some kind of sky blue. And we're going to make sure to draw it all the way at 0 and 0. This now fills up my entire room with blue. Now this looks great, but I might want to add some instances to my room. So I'm going to click on the instance layer, and I'm going to open up my objects resource menu and select something to put in. I'm going to put in this object of Mario. Now he's really, really tiny. That's because I haven't set the size of my room yet, but we'll get to that. But it's as easy as that. All I had to do was drag an object in and place it where I wanted it. And because I have grid snap on, the center of Mario snapped to an intersection. Like that. Now you see when I select him, he gets a blue bounding box. These are controls for this image. I'm allowed to scale him, snapping to grid, because I have snap to grid turned on. I could turn that off and freeform it. There we go. I can also go to the corners and rotate, and of course I can grab and move Mario around. This is also accomplished in the Instance Property panel. I can use this checkbox to select whether or not this should export when the game is finalized and it, and it builds. If it's turned off though, the code won't run. So if you have instances in your room that require the code from that instance of an object, you're going to want it turned on. But if you need to turn it off for some reason, you just easily turn this checkbox off. You can also double click on the instance 
to open up a more fine-tuned version of what I was doing. So I can put in a text field, the actual rotation, zero will be back to the way it was. I can also flip the X, there it is, it's flipping on its um, origin point. I can also flip the Y and I can change the scale. I'm going to go back to one, that's default, that's like 100%. This is also the position in the room where it's lying. It's, it's in 484 by 533. From here, I can also change the object if I didn't want this to be this object, but I do. I can also edit the object. If I click this, I can now start editing the object from where it came from. Same as double clicking over here, except actually in the room. And the last option is this really great feature called creation code. This is code that will run when this particular instance is created. Um, typically you have a create event in your object and it does a bunch of stuff, but this will happen for every single instance of that object. But if I only wanted this instance to do something specific, I can actually put it in this creation code and when this instance is created in this room, when the room starts up, this code will run as well as the creation code from the object itself. So it can do something different uh, or something extra. Another great feature is the asset layer. So if I click on the button to create the asset layer, there we go, I've got one. And what you can do with this is drag a sprite in and put it anywhere you want. So it's kind of like just drawing something to the room based on a sprite you've created, but it's not actually attached to an object, so it doesn't have all that overhead or all that processing power of an object just to get something to animate. Like if I had little bushes that animated, I could just grab one of them, throw them in here, hit the play button. Look at that. We've got Mario running, but this isn't an object or an instance of an object. This is just a sprite being drawn somewhere in the room, which is great because, like I said, Objects have a lot of code attached to them, so there's a lot of processing power you might not need just to draw an image. So that's what your asset layer is for. But I don't actually want these, so I'm going to click them and hit my delete key and get rid of them. Of course, there are a lot of other things you can do in your layers panel and your properties panel for your layers, mostly to do with tile sets and paths, but I'll get into that later. You can also right click on one of these layers and go to the layer property, which would be open down here by default, but if it isn't, you can click this and it'll open up this panel. You can also rename, delete, duplicate the layer. You can add a layer from here, same as clicking one of these buttons, or you can add a sub layer like that. It now is attached to this asset layer. So what I've created is a child to a parent layer. So if I hit this visibility button, they both become invisible. In fact, that's what these buttons do. I've got my instance down here, and if I hit visibility, it just turns it off in the room. Just, just the visibility for the room editor, because you might have a lot of layers of stuff and you might need to turn them off so you can see what you're doing. You can also lock them, and in this case, they won't be able to be edited anymore. This applies only to the room editor. Now let's clear some stuff I don't need anymore. So I'm going to delete that entire group right there. I'm going to recenter this. And now I'm going to talk about the room properties. So I'm going to hit these triangles here, these chevrons, and collapse these panels, and just look at the room panel. And in here I've got room settings, viewports and cameras, and room physics. Physics will be in another video, but it is here when you need it. Now we've got room settings. The first option we've got is persistent. What this means is when a room is first loaded up in GameMaker, it runs all the creation code and it spawns all of the instances of objects. It does everything it's supposed to do during the create event and then starts running the room during the step event and draw and all of those events. Now, when you leave the room and come back, assuming you can do that in your game, GameMaker wants to know, should it start the room again and do all that creation code again? Or should it leave everything the way it was and just hop right into like step and draw and all the other events? Now, if you're making an RPG, let's say an action RPG, and you kill some monsters, and they have corpses on the ground, and you leave the room, if you come back, do you want those corpses to stay on the floor, or do you want them to spawn again and the room is just like it was the first time you saw it? Well, if you want the monsters to spawn again, don't have persistent on. In this case, all the creation code will just run again. But if you turn it on, 
That means your room will stay in the state it was when you left it. So if you come back, those monsters are now lying on the floor and it's just running the step and draw and all the other events, but not the creation part. So it really just depends on the kind of game you're making. Let's say for my game, I don't need it. So I'm gonna turn it off. The next button has to do with uh, views in your room. It has to do with the display buffer and whether or not you should clear the display buffer with some sort of color or, or whatever. In this case, um, I don't need it on technically because I'm drawing a full color to the background here. So I'm never actually going to see the, the buffer going on behind it. It's this black void. Here's an example of what it would look like uh, if I didn't have a background color. You can see that Mario is running and constantly being drawn to this black void, like there are too many Marios. Uh, that's the display buffer. But in my case, I'm drawing a full color to the background, so I'm never going to see that display buffer, so I don't even have to worry about this, and I'll just turn it off, because it's not going to come into uh, account at the moment. Now here's the most important part of your room, is setting the room size. Um, it's not necessarily the window that the player is going to see when they run your game, and it's not necessarily the view in the room that the player gets to see, but this is the entire room. Now, let's imagine we're making a Mario level, since we've got Mario here. And a level in Mario, you'll notice, is one strip, a long strip that you run all the way to a flagpole on a castle. Now, in Game Maker, one great way to do that is to draw out the entire level from start to finish, and then only show a portion of that. So let's say that the height of a Mario game would be 224, and then let's say that the width would be whatever. I don't know how long this Mario room is going to be, so we'll keep it at 1024. Now, unfortunately, we've lost Mario here, so one thing we can do is click on our instance layer, click on this, and we can just delete him. And I'll just drag him back in. Here's the object right here. There. I got him back. The next section actually has a creation code for the room itself. So when the room starts up, it can also get its own creation code. So you can write something specific for this room. This uh, means you don't need to actually have an object in this room for something to happen. You can write some code here, and when the room starts up, uh, Game Maker will go through it and do and execute whatever you've written, uh, which is great because you don't need to use an object when it's not necessary. Let's center our room back in view. There we go. We also have the instance creation order. This is a different panel and it opens up down here. We can also access it by using our room dropdown. From here we have our layer panel, room properties panel, the layer properties panel, and the instance creation order panel, which I just opened. But you can also open it from here. I can also reset it to the way it looked when I first opened the room. There we go. In which case I don't have the creation order panel, which I can click this to open up, or I can click here to open up. As for tiles, we'll get into that in another video. So let's open up our creation order again. This tells you in what order the instances will be created in your room. Now, that might not matter to you, but sometimes one instance of an object has code that a different instance needs to access. Well, in that case, this other instance, whatever it is, needs to exist first. So let's grab this impassable object and just throw that in. So now we've got these two. But let's say that Mario would require this to exist first. Well, all i got to do is drag it and put it on top. There we go. So now this will be created and then this one will be created. So once again, that might not matter to you, but just in case it does, here's how you drag and reorder your creation order. I'm going to minimize that for now. And then we're going to get into viewports and cameras. So as I said, if I ran this game right now, this would be the entire room and view and window on screen. To show you an example, let me reorder my rooms over here. Now, your resources in your rooms drop down here. This is actually the order in which the rooms will appear in your game, unless you code it to go somewhere else. So room test, I want this one to open up first when I run my game. So I'm going to drag it up here and make it the first one to open. So if I run the game now, I can show you what I mean. You can see that the room that opened up was room test. And here it is, the full 224 by 1024, or 1024 by 224. And that's it. That's the room size. It's the view size. It's the viewport size. It's everything. But that's probably not what you want for your game we might want to look at a very specific portion. And in that case, we can use viewports and cameras. Now I'll go into camera creation in another video, but let's just look at viewports. So the first thing you'll want to do is enable viewports. Let's check that. 
the next thing I'm going to want to do is drop down one of these viewports. Now zero is the first one and seven is the last, giving you eight viewports to work with, which is great for things like split screen, but I'll get into that later. Let's just drop down zero and make it visible. Now we've got this really big box. Now the reason we can see this box is because of this button right here, Show Views. If it's not on, we don't get to see what the view looks like. Now just like when we were setting our background, we've got kind of the same options. We can change its position. So right now it's sitting at zero, zero in the room. The top left corner is its position. I can move it somewhere else if I need to. There we go. And we'll say 50 there. So if for some reason I need to see this section of the room, I can always move it around with these options. I'm not going to need that. The next thing is width. Now this is what portion of your room do you want to look at? Well, there's no reason to see below the room and that wouldn't even show up anyway. So let's match the height of our room. So 224, there we go. And let's not see all of the room because in something like a Mario game, you wouldn't anyway, you'd only see a specific portion. So let's make that something like 240. Now we have this little box here. So this is all we're going to see when we run the game. And I'll show you what that looks like. There we go, we're only seeing that square portion of the room, although we are seeing it in a very big window. Well, that has to do with the viewport, and right now it's set to 1024 and 768. Well, let's not do that. Let's make it exactly the same. Let's make it 240 and 224. And if I run the game again, we can now see we have a box in our room showing 224, or 240 by 224, and then a window when I run the game of 240 and 224. So we can really play around with this. Like if we wanted it to be bigger, we can make it double 480 by 448. Now running that will still be the same box or view in the room, but the viewport, the actual window when playing the game, is twice the size. Typically you want this to be a one-to-one uh, -one and then some sort of multiple of that. So starting at something like 240 and 224, it's exactly the same. That means our sprites won't stretch. Then I can double, triple, quadruple it to change the actual size. If I made it something not in line with, like not a multiple of the original camera properties, let's say, uh, I don't know, 500 and 500, this is not the same. So if I were to run the game, everything would be stretched out because it's not the same uh, image-wise. To show you an example of that, I'm going to go into a room I've already made, room zero. In here, I've got pretty much the same setup, the 240, 224, the 480, 448, that's double, but let's make it that 500 by, let's do 200, something really obscure and that's not the right size. If I were to run this game and make sure it's the first room that runs, you'll see it's really stretched out because the window is showing 500 pixels wide, 200 pixels high, but we're trying to fit this 240 by 224 box into this window, and to do that, it's going to stretch out. So it's probably not what you want in the game. Typically you want them to be exactly the same numbers or you want your viewport to be a multiple, uh, multiplying it by half or double or triple, whatever you need to do. The last option for your view is object following. This allows you to pick an object in the room that the viewport should try to center itself on. In this case I'm centering it on Mario. Then we've got this horizontal and vertical border, as well as a speed set to negative one, so there's no speed at the moment. And if I were to run this game, and also make sure that this is set back to, let's say, 480 by 448, and run the game, we can see that we've got Mario here, and we've got our viewport set up, and our camera set up, and everything great. And because my horizontal border is 32, what this means is when Mario is 32 pixels away from the edge of the screen, the camera will move with him. So let's do that. There we go. So he's 32 pixels away, so the camera's pushing with him. You can imagine that there is this invisible border that's 32 in from the top, top and bottom, because it's 32 on the vertical border, and 32 in from the left and right. And when Mario butts up against it, the camera has to push to follow. Now, if you don't want that in your game, we can change that to horizontal border. Right now, our width is 240. As long as we meet half of that, let's say 120, that means the border will go halfway into the room from both sides, so dead center. We could also do the same with the vertical, so that means 112. If we were to run the game again, Mario would be centered in view 
and the camera would follow perfectly all the time, like this. So you can see it doesn't wait till I get to the edge of the screen, it just keeps following Mario dead center because the borders are now 120 in, meeting Mario in the middle, and they're also 112 up and down, so if I jump, it would also follow Mario. Although you wouldn't be able to see that here because there's nowhere for the camera to go. See, when I go to the left, the camera stops following Mario because the cameras in Game Maker will not go past the size of the room. I can go this way because there's more space in my room, but I can't go this way. Same reason it won't follow me when I jump. There's just no room up and down. The camera fits the room perfectly. Now I can also change the speed. Right now it's set to negative one and negative one, but let's set it to something like one. This means the camera, when Mario reaches the border, we'll set it to 32 again, the camera will move one pixel at a time uh, whenever Mario has exceeded this boundary. So if I run the game, and we can see we're not following anymore, if I move Mario outside of that 32 boundary, there we go, the camera tries to keep him <laughs> in view, but it's only moving one pixel at a time. So it might be something you want to use in your game to slowly move toward a point. Just like that, left and right. If I wanted to go faster, I would increase this speed. And once again, we talked about the borders, whatever you want to do with that. This also works for vertical speed. One last thing I want to mention for your room is whenever you're dealing with placing your assets or your uh, instances or whatever, typically you can only move the uh, assets or instances that are on the layer you have selected. So in this case I've got collision selected. These are just all my object impasse. So if I try to grab Mario and move him, I, I'm, I'm not allowed. He's not on this layer, but I can grab all of my walls, just like that. But there is a way for you to select Mario, even though he's on a different layer. And that's this last button right here called select from any layer. If I click it, I can now just once click on something and then manipulate it. It'll automatically snap to this layer that I selected and the whatever the asset is that I've selected, and there we go, and it turns itself off, so I can't select something else again. But if you want to permanently use it, you can use the P key. If you see right there, the hotkey is P. As long as I'm holding the P key down, this is on. See that? So if I'm holding P, I can now move anything from any layer. It doesn't matter. Just one small thing to keep in mind if you don't want to keep clicking back and forth on all these different layers just to grab the one thing you want. And with that, you now know the basics of a room. You can move your sprites into an asset layer or your instances onto an instance layer, set up a background from sprites or put a background color in. You also know how to go into these properties and change your room size and add a view and manipulate the viewport and how your view can actually follow an object. Of course, there are a few more things to talk about in a room like physics or parenting rooms, but that'll be for another time. Mm -hmm.